this lecture, we're going to be looking at globalization and crime. We're going to be looking at how globalization has changed crime in the sense of the types of crimes that are being committed, as well as the impact that globalization has had on crime and the policing of crime and whether or not we're going to evaluate whether or not this is actually as new a phenomena as some people make it out to be. Now, we've already discussed previously what globalization is. It's the ongoing process that's the that's creating an interconnected world, and that's on an economic, cultural, social and political level. So what we're seeing is the decline, according to postmodernists, of the nation state and the creation of a more global society, more global community, because these different spheres, the economic, cultural, social and political, are becoming more and more integrated with each other through around the world. And this has had quite a big impact on crime. So held um et al, um i don't know who the et al are um has pointed out that the globalization of crime has created this kind of transnational organized crime so rather than organized crime being uh, to a specific geographical area for example the yakuza in japan the triads in china the mafia in italy um they're now spreading out around the world and there are enclaves of these organized crime groups throughout the world. You may not think it, but there are Yakuza groups in the UK. Um, we see it a lot in the media, in, in kind of America and places like that. But these transnational organized crime groups are growing around the world. And Manuel Castells, and I'm probably mispronouncing that and I apologise massively, but he has worked, estimated that the annual global criminal economy, so the um, black economy, if you like, the, the unregulated economy that comes from criminal activity is worth over one trillion dollars per annum. OK, and that's trillion with a T. So this is a huge, huge economic system really of crim crime that is occurring around the world it's not limited to a single geographical location so what sort of crimes are we talking about here well we're talking about things like financial crimes and this is very much within the corporate white collar sphere but in transnational organized crime groups are, are cashing in on these financial loopholes that have been created through globalization. For example, things like offshore accounts, places like the Cayman Islands um, and Switzerland and places like that, where you can have these accounts that are completely undetectable. Um, you're your account doesn't have a name attached to it. It's just an account number. I mean, you can't just rock up with 10 quid and open one of these accounts. You're looking at having to have a starting balance of thousands, um, tens of thousands. And it is um, these sort of accounts where people are able to launder their money. They're able to put in the money that has been created through illegal means and then transfer it all over the world to create a more um, clean amount of money so that it's kind of passed through so many hands that it then doesn't trace back to that initial illegal activity. You've also got tax evasion where companies will register their, their companies offshore in places like the Isle of Man, in Europe, here in um, tax haven countries, so that they then don't have to pay corporation tax, again, corporate crime. Um, and 
these companies tend to can be quite big companies. Amazon has not paid corporation tax in the UK ever. And the government's not going to go after them because as a transnational company, they could very easily just turn and say, well, we'll take our business out, out of the UK then. And the, the government can't afford for them to do that due to the number of people that they employ and the revenue that they do actually create in the UK for Amazon um, shop owners, um, for companies and things like that. So um, tax evasion is a huge area of crime. But these financial crimes, though they do, as I say, tend to be white collar and corporate in nature, they're not limited to white collar and corporate crimes. Drug traffickers, organized crime, these, these types of criminal enterprises will use the same processes as legitimate companies in order to clean their money, to avoid tax and things like that. You then got trafficking and there are lots of different types of trafficking that has grown over the last few years. The obvious ones being arms trafficking, people trafficking and modern slavery. But we're also seeing growth in things like organ trafficking. Um, it's estimated that over 2000 organs per year are trafficked around the world in a black market economy. So people who have the money but can't get on the transplant list or don't want to wait for a legitimate organ to be made available will procure their organ through the black market. And a lot of these black market organs are coming from um, condemned or executed criminals. They're coming from people who haven't authorised um, organ donation after their deaths. Um, and there are also, in some cases, organised live organ trafficking. And what that means is people who are in absolute poverty and complete desperation will sell a kidney or cornea or an organ that they can survive without limitedly to this black market economy and we're also seeing the sex trafficking increasing particularly women and children um, but women and children are also trafficked for slavery purposes, modern slavery purposes, sweatshops, um, even in, in private homes. There have been cases in the last couple of years where people have been found to have been enslaved in London homes um, where the owner of the home, their employer, and I use that word loosely, holds on to their passport, doesn't pay them, works them horrifically which is a form of modern slavery. And globalization has allowed these things to happen because there is an ease of transport. It's much easier to get people from place A to place B um, and a lot quicker as well. Although we do have border controls and we do have um, passport control and things like that, there are ways to get around it. And these criminal enterprises will know all of the loopholes and all of the ways around it. Things like modern slavery, um, these people may enter the country legally on a tourist visa or a short term work visa. But once they're here, their passport's taken away. They're not given access to um, communication to their families and things like that. They're not paid. They're told that their pay their wages has to go towards paying for their transport to this new country. We've also got the rise of terrorism. Now, terrorism isn't a new thing. This has been around for centuries. But where, what globalization has done, has it has expanded terrorist activity and allowed for that expansion to take place. Technological and communication advancements mean that international terrorism online radicalization has increased and rather than training somebody up or 
radicalizing someone in your own country and then getting them into the country in which you're attacking, you can radicalize somebody within their own um, country. And we, see, we saw that with the um, Paris bombings. The, the people that carried out those bombings, the, I think it was a concert, a restaurant, um, it was about four targeted attacks in one night. The, the people that carried that out were Belgian citizens who have free movement throughout the European Union. They weren't of um, Middle Eastern background. They had been radicalized within Belgium and they were then used as fodder essentially to carry out this attack. So the ISIS, the group that claimed responsibility for the Paris attacks, has no longer has to have a way of getting their people into a country. They can create their people within the country they already are in. And the drugs trade. The drugs trade, again, not a new thing, been around for centuries. Um, but it's estimated that over 300 billion a year is made from the drugs trade, the illegal drugs trade. We're not talking legal drugs here. Um, and what we're seeing is that the cultivation of these drugs in um, developing countries such as Colombia, Peru, and Afghanistan, where they've got massively impoverished populations, find that drug cultivation is the only way for them to make money, to make a living, to survive. And then with the um, technological invent, uh, advancements in terms of transport, communication and money transfer, those drugs can more easily be transported around the world to the markets that are buying them. So although the drugs trade and terrorism are not new crimes, they are developed and expanded due to capitalist, uh, sorry, due to globalization. Now I've already mentioned about transnational organized crime and Glennie refers to this as a muck mafia, which um, has developed as the global markets have become deregulated and have become more um, technological, I guess, digital in nature. Um, the old school mafias, such as the Italian mafias and the triads and things like that, they're not just staying in one place anymore. They can still have their leadership in Japan, or the triads in China, uh, the mafia in Russia, they can still have their leadership there. But with the financial deregulation, it's much easier to transfer money around the world and develop those transnational organized crime systems. Now, one area of crime that has developed as a new crime, thanks to globalization, is cybercrime. And cybercrime obviously links to computers and it is a new crime because computers are and the Internet are relatively new. It's only about just over 25 years old. Um, so whereas things like the drugs trade, human trafficking and things like that, cybercrime is in fact a new crime. And there are different types of cybercrime. And Wall has categorized these into um, a few different categories and a lot of the time these can overlap they're not distinct boxes that we can just kind of say that's that and that's that it, it there is some overlap the first type of crime um, that will comes up with is cyber deception and theft and what he means with this is things like phishing illegal downloads identity theft and personalized hacking and what I mean by personalized hacking is not hacking a company or an institution. It's more about hacking an individual to get their credit card details, to get their bank details, um, things like that, which we would consider cyber deception and theft. Other things that we can also put in here are things which have developed more recently, things like catfishing. 
and um, through things like Facebook and online dating and things like that, people have, and I mean, there's an entire TV show dedicated to it, that people will pretend to be somebody else in order to get money, to get um, stuff, um, or just to be nasty and malicious. The second type of cybercrime is pornogra pornographic cybercrime. And we're not talking about things like um, regulated porn companies who create legal content. What we're talking about here is things like child pornography and the sharing of child pornography with the Internet and with um, computers. It has made it much harder for um, the police to detect. There are techniques and tricks that paedophiles will use to share images, share videos. Obviously, there's the dark web, which is completely untraceable. Um, there's also what has developed recently is the revenge porn type um, crime. And it is a crime. Revenge porn in the UK is a crime. And this is the uploading of uh, video or images of a person engaging in a sexual activity or being sexually explicit without their consent or their knowledge. So they may have consented to the picture being taken, but they didn't consent to it being distributed. They may they or you that it may be a case of that you they have been videoed engaging in sexual activity without their consent. So the Internet has uh, created opportunities for this type of crime to develop. And as I say, revenge porn in the UK is illegal. Only recently, but it is still illegal. You've also got cyber trespass. And what we're talking about with cyber trespass is hacking. Um, and this can be both personal hacking and corporate hacking. This is where you get the DDS attacks or the ransomware attacks, um, where companies are told pay a certain amount of money or we're never going to let you into your um, accounts again. Um, a good example of a um, ransomware attack that didn't quite go the way it intended was the Ashley Madison attack, where um, hackers got into their servers, got into their um, membership files and started releasing information about their members. Now, for those of you who don't know what Ashley Madison is, it was a website for adultery. So it was a website that facilitated people committing adultery. And what when when the whole scandal came out, what was shocking was the number of government um, members who were using this website. Um, and we're not necessarily talking about ministers and things like that, but people who have a .gov email address. Um, another part of cyber trespass is viruses, sending uh, viruses. Obviously, we're always told as part of digital citizenship and digital safety not to open links that we're not sure where they've come from. Um, and a lot of this comes in terms of what seem like legitimate websites or uh, legitimate companies emailing you. Now, my advice is always check the actual email it's coming from. For example, uh, there was a virus being sent around using um, a, an email that said it was from the DVLA, saying that you hadn't paid your road tax or there was a problem with your road tax and you had to click this link to get your road tax sorted. But when you looked at the actual email, it was a Gmail account. The DVLA do not use Gmail. Amazon don't use Hotmail. Yeah, so always check where the email is coming from before clicking any links or anything like that, because that's the, the easiest way for people to hackers and that uh, the like to get viruses into your machine. And cyber trespass is getting into systems that you don't have permission to be in. Now, there is. There are people, there are companies which are called white hat hackers, that phrase, um, 
who their, their job is to try and get into systems to see if there are any flaws in the security, to see if there are any issues with the um, with access or anything like that. That is not illegal because the company have given them permission to be in their systems, but they've not given them access deliberately. OK. The final type of cybercrime is cyber violence. Now, this may seem like a bit of a an oxymoron or a, a bit of a re weird one because cybercrime takes place online. So how can that be violent? Um, what Wall identifies here is things like cyberbullying, terrorist websites and hate based sites. So we could call this a, a sense of symbolic violence um, rather than actual physical violence. But what we've also um, what, uh, there was a case recently, and it's coming out as a film soon as well, where a girl essentially goaded her boyfriend, sort of boyfriend, into committing suicide. She wasn't physically there, but her instant messaging and her text messages were things like, go on, do it. You know you want to do it. You told me you're going to do it. Go, just get on and do it. Stop being a coward. So she goaded him into it and she was charged with um, negligent homicide and cyber violence. This was an American case, so it, it, it's slightly different to the UK. But cyber bullying, which leads to suicide, is a criminal offence in the UK, meaning that if somebody is cyber bullied to the point that they commit suicide or try to commit suicide, it becomes a police matter. Um, hate based websites, they are also um, a form of cyber crime. Now, the, the difficulty is with these is where the, the kind of balance between freedom of speech and hate crime. Now, the law in the UK says that you have freedom of speech as long as you are not um, inciting hatred towards a particular group. So websites which are targeted at an individual are illegal. Websites that are targeted at specific groups are illegal. Now, because it can be quite difficult to prosecute an individual person for these things, what generally happens is the site is taken down. Um, if they can get hold of an individual to prosecute, they will. But again, the law takes a long time to catch up with the developments in technology. So with globalization and with um, technological advancements, it becomes very difficult to prosecute. And we'll come back to that in a bit in a little bit later. So we've seen these all these different types of crime that have developed. Some are not new, some are are new. But what has been the impact of globalization on crime? How has it affected crime? Well, um, Taylor talks about more inequality. And what he's talking about here is that globalization creates new patterns of inequality. The winners from the process are the rich financial investors, the transnational corporations, whereas the losers are the workers. So we're seeing this from a quite a Marxist perspective. The disadvantaged in both the developing and the developed world are facing greater insecurity and greater relative deprivation, which then feeds into criminal behavior. So we're seeing like, what he means with this is that um, the greater insecurity coming from the terrorism, from geopolitics and things like that, the greater relative deprivation is we're no longer limited to what do the people in my society have that I don't have? What do the people in my country have that I don't have? We're now comparing ourselves to people in other countries. Shows like Keeping Up With The Kardashians, um, the Hills, The Hills Revisited, those sort of reality TV shows which are now being beamed into our homes are creating that sense of relative deprivation. Even shows that you don't even think about in terms of being uh, creating that relative deprivation. Selling Sunset is a real estate programme, but it's still creating that relative deprivation. 
And when you feel like, as we've seen with left realism, when you feel like that you are deprived, you may turn to criminal activity in order to get the things that you think you should have. Bowman talks about growing individualism. And what he's talking about here is the consumer culture where individuals are left to weigh the cost benefit of their decisions and choose the best course of action to bring them the highest rewards. So we're not thinking necessarily about the environmental impact. We're not, we're, the fast fashion industry is a really good example of growing individualism where we're, we, we want the cheap t-shirt, we want the cheap clothing, we want the Primark, the everything5pounds.com, we want that quick and easy clothing, but we don't necessarily then think about the modern slavery that occurs in order to get that cheap, fast fashion. Um, or we may think about it, but we don't really engage with it because it's not affecting us directly. We're still getting the fast fashion. We're still getting the quick clothing and the cheap clothing that we want. And yes, we're aware, and these companies will, will say the right things and they'll do the right, or, or make it look like they're doing the right things, but modern slavery still exists. So people end up taking part in a criminal activity through their consumer lifestyle, which they may not otherwise they may not be aware of by buying those products by engaging with certain companies we are facilitating those um, criminal activities and um, the next one is talking about opportunities globalization has made it immensely easier to commit crime there are more ways to carry out crime, cyber crime, transnational crime, all of these things, all of the types of crime that we don't press and necessarily think about. The dark web, the, the Silk Road, as it was called, which was a website where you could literally buy anything. You could hire a hitman, you could buy drugs, you could buy um, weaponry, pornography, child pornography, people, organs nothing you could also buy non-illegal items on the silk road as well but none of the there was no regulation on in the dark web um and this has created more opportunities for people to commit crime we've seen it in true crime documentaries where people have hired hitmen to take out their spouse um or they've used the dark web to share pornographic child pornography or pornographic material um, and there's a brilliant um, documentary about the Silk Road which is looking at the supposed um, creator of the Silk Road and I can't remember what his name is um, he went by the handle of Dread Pirate Roberts which is a character from The Princess Bride and it's uh, the community argues that there isn't one Dread Pirate Roberts. Just like in the film, the, ne the name was passed on from person to person within the film. And the, the title of Dread Pirate Roberts within the Silk Road was also passed on from person to person. There isn't one individual who is responsible for the Silk Road. And as quickly as the, the um, authorities were able to take it down, it was coming back up again which is the issue with the dark web. You've got to find it, you then got to try and take it down, but then they just pop back up again. Um, but globalization has created more opportunities for people to engage in criminal activity when they may not even realize they are. Things like illegal downloads, they are a criminal act, but people still do it, okay? Beck also talks about greater risk. Globalization has created growing instability, and this has led to be people to people being more risk conscious. The causes of the risk are often global in nature, which can make it hard to pinpoint responsibility. Things like climate change um, has created an idea of greater risk, and we'll talk about green crime later in another lecture. Um, but terrorism uh, in, um, and things like that, where it's really hard to just 
pinpoint who is responsible and get a sense of justice. He also talks about how this um, has been played on by the media and the way that the media, as we talked about in a previous lecture, can fan the flames of hatred against certain groups and lead to racially motivated crimes. We saw that after 9-11 and the July 7th bombings, that there was a 2000 percent increase in hate crimes against uh, Muslims after those attacks. Um, so globalization has created this sense of risk when people feel at risk, when they feel that the world around them is unstable, that can lead them to engaging in criminal activities such as hate crime or racially motivated crime, which they wouldn't necessarily have engaged in previously. And finally, we've got Keat and Uri, uh, sorry, Lash and Uri, um, talking about disorganized capitalism. And here they're talking about the deregulation of international finance. So as state controls over business and business finance are broken down because of offshore registration of companies, offshore bank accounts and things like that, corporations are able to act in a transnational way, moving money, manufacturing, waste disposable, staff, all of these things to different parts of the world to increase their profits. For example, as I said about Amazon, who the UK government won't go after for their corporation tax bill because Amazon could remove their, their business from the UK, which would lead to high unemployment. With Brexit, a number of companies moved their business from the UK, their manufacturing, I think Jeep was one of them, moved their manufacturing from the UK to mainland Europe because of the deregulation and the lack of um, trade agreements and things like that, that were making profits harder to come by. Um, Taylor also jumped in on this and said that this deorganization of, uh, sorry, deorganized capitalism had led to greater job insecurity and less social cohesion, fewer jobs, which has then increased crime rates because of deprivation. Okay. But has globalization really had that much of an impact? So here we go, here we're going into our evaluation. And as I said earlier, the crimes that we're talking about, other than perhaps cybercrime, they're not new crimes. Drug trafficking has been around for centuries. So has people trafficking. So has organ trafficking once organ um, transplantation was um, possible, obviously. Um, Organised crime has existed. Uh, even if we go back to um, the early days of the um, Americas in, in the 1800s and, and um, 1900s, organized crime was moving from Italy into America, Russia into America, the triads, the Yakuza, all of these groups as their, their countrymen, as their um, cultures were moving into this new country, this, this, this new land. So the crime followed with them. It's really hard to, to get a good grasp on the impact of globalization crime because it's almost impossible to investigate. There are no secondary data on the black economy. It's all estimated. Um, getting in with these transnational organized crime groups is extremely dangerous. So they're not exactly going to invite a sociologist in to to see how their operation works. So it's really difficult for sociologists to investigate the impact and effect of globalization on crime because they can't get in there. So a lot of the, the information we have is educated guesswork. And there is a dependence on secondary sources in the sense of not necessarily statistics, but um, newspaper articles, um, memoirs of people who were in 
organized crime and things like that getting primary data is virtually impossible for a sociologist and it's argued that perhaps it's exaggerated the significance of globalization on crime because as we said the crimes were always there they were already there um but it's very easy to cat catastrophize is that the right word? I think so. Um, these the impact of globalization and how awful it's been when perhaps it hasn't quite been as bad as we think because we don't have the data to say one way or the other. And again, crime tends still to be fairly routine, low level offences committed in local communities. These transnational organized crime groups they're very glamorized and talked about as being these huge organizations. But at the end of the day, they are still, the crimes that are being committed still tend to be quite low level, quite um, local to the community in which is, which is victimized by the crime. So let's talk about globalization and policing. Um, so there are a number of issues that come up with the with policing globalized um, crime. The fact that it is transnational in nature. Who is going to prosecute? Whose jurisdiction is it in? Um, for example, in when it comes to drug trafficking, they have to wait for the drug traffickers to come out of international waters before they can do anything. Because when you're in international waters, you don't nation states do not have jurisdiction it's also why a ship's captain can marry someone when they're in international waters but that's completely beside the point um but jurisdiction who has jurisdiction this is particularly the case with cybercrime. if you're hacked in norfolk england by somebody who's in ontario canada who prosecutes do you prosecute in Ontario, Canada, because that's where the hacker is? Or do you prosecute in Norfolk, England, because that's where the victim is? So it becomes an international incident. You also have differing laws. What is legal in one country is not illegal in another. So, um, for example, with cybercrime, again, the law takes so long to change that certain crimes which are illegal in the UK may not be illegal in the country that the hacker is in. So have they actually broken the law? And we don't currently have a international criminal law. When we talk about international law, what we're talking about is agreements between countries. They're not actual laws in the same way that we would have state law. And then again, you've got those cultural differences as well. What is and is not acceptable. The other issue is legislation delays. As we talked about this earlier, the law ch takes a long time to change or even create. So technology, um, globalization, cultural differences, all of these things change a lot quicker than the law can. So th th it took, I think it was something like six or seven years to make revenge porn illegal because the, the issue had to be raised as a criminal issue. It then had to be debated. The law had to be made. It had to be debated again. It then had to go to the House of Lords. So it's a really long process to create a law. And by the time the law is created, the technology has developed further. But it's not all bad news. There has been greater international cooperation. We have Interpol and Europol who are kind of like an international police force, but not really. Um, they are police officers from their nation states who work collaboratively in um, dealing with transnational crime. Um, you also have an increasing number of international agreements, things like extradition. So countries agree that they will, if a criminal is in their country, they will send them back to the country where the crime, where they're being prosecuted. Um, there are limits on this, 
for example, in the UK, we will not send somebody back for prosecution if there is a possibility of execution. So, for example, the United States, if we were to extradite somebody to the United States, it would be on the condition that they would be exempt from the death penalty because we do not have death penalty here in the UK. And the globalisation has created greater awareness of issues, particularly things like modern slavery, tra people trafficking, organ trafficking and things like that. So we, we now aren't as it's not as easy to hide your head in the sand. Um, there are media exposés about fast fashion, global impact, dumping of sewage and waste runoff and things like that. So globalisation has created greater awareness and with greater awareness comes greater pressure to do something about it. So policing and globalisation has got its issues and they're always going to be there whilst the nation state is still um, thing. But with greater cooperation, greater awareness, more is being done to combat some of these international crimes that, that globalisation has developed and um, supported. So we know what globalisation is. We've looked at the different types of crimes that globalisation has facilitated and created. And we've looked at the impact of globalisation on crime.